Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, the shir tonight is about Yishmoel and Edom. Yishmoel and Edom. We've discussed many times, probably now, the concept of the exiles of the Jewish people are four. It's based on a um, Medrash Rabbah in Bereshis. And it says, Rabbi Shemim and Yilokish Pasa Kriya Begolius. Rabbi Shalokish Rabbi Shemim and explained <coughs> the Hidash and the Posuk, Vaharetz Hayusovo Vachoshal Alpene Sahom. And the land was so vavo, formless and empty, that's translated into English. Of course, these words are not really useful in. They have specific meanings in Hebrew. So vavo, v'choshech al home and darkness on the face of the deep. And the Medrash explains that these represent the four great historical exiles that the Jewish people will undergo. V'ha'yu ha'oritz, so, so is formless. <coughs> that is the exile of Bovel. And uh, he brings a posik for it. It's a posik in Yirmiya. Uh, so, I saw the land and it was uh, formless, barren, desolate. So that's the first. Of course, this posik is right at the beginning of the Torah. Right? So, but anything which is right at the beginning of the Torah, the closer something is to the beginning, the more fundamental it must be. So this really represents some fundamental aspect of the history of the world, as we know. So so vavo, and then he brings the posik for vo, which is from Esther. So vo ze golas modai, that's modai bedia, which is also Persia. And it says, Vayivhilu la havi es hamon, and they, they uh, have hivhilu, they kind of rushed. Another kind of word for uh, desolation or emptiness. Vivhilu es hamon, so so vavo vachoshech ze golas yovan, that's the exile of Greece. Shehichishu. Einehem shall Israel sorry, Shechisha. Now this exile, this Golas Yovan, darkened the eyes of the Jewish people. Because they were saying with their decrees, Shaya Omer Lehem, they said to them, Kisu al Keren Ashor, write on the horn of an ox, Shainahem Chelek Beloke Israel. So we're going to come to this, this idea of the darkness, which is Greece. We're getting closer now to Hanukkah. <coughs> Bezat Hashem, we'll start talking about Hanukkah maybe next week or the week, probably next week. That's going to be our main topic. Greece is the third exile. That's the, Greek, that's the exile of darkness. And Al Peneha home, on the face of the deep, Zegolus Malchus Harosha, that's the um, kingdom of Rome. It's called here the Malchus Harosha, the evil nation, <coughs> the evil kingdom, Shein lehem heker, that has no recognition, kamoha to home, meaning it seems to go on and on and on. What the Medrash is referring to here is basically that the first three exiles were of much shorter duration. The exile of Bavel, Babylon, the Jews, Jewish people were in exile for 70 years. The exile of Poros and Madai was 52 years. In Persia, the story of uh, Esther. Then Greece, Hanukkah, that was 180 years. Um, an interesting aspect of the exile of Greece is we never actually left Eretz Israel, but it's still considered an exile. When a person can be in his own country and still be exiled from himself, from his true identity, this was the success of Greece, that they managed to Hellenize the Jewish people, to put them into exile, put us into exile, even without us leaving the country. And the last exile is that of Rome. Now, Rome has been going on for <coughs> close to 2,000 years, since the Romans captured there at Israel in the 70th year of the Common Era. And it seems to go on and on and on and on. And actually, the, the, uh, the Torah tells us, Rashi says, right at the end of, um, of Pasha's um, Vayishlach, that the last we know that Rome... How do we know Rome? Where do you see Rome? Because Rashi says that Malkiel, Malkiel is the last of the kings listed of, of the descendants of Edom. Edom is Esau, 
So Esau becomes Edom, and Edom, you look at the end of the Parshas of Ayishlach, you'll see all the list of the kings of Edom, and the last one of those is called, sorry, not Malkiel, Magdiel. And Rashi says, Magdiel, who Romi? And it's interesting that that very same Haftorah of Ayishlach, the Haftorah we read, is the prophecy, the prophecy of Avadia. Avadia was a gear from the nation of Edom, <coughs> and he writes <coughs> about Edom. Im tagbia keneshe, if you'll rise up like a, uh, a like an eagle. Really, one should preface this with another medrash. There's another medrash which des- describes the dream of Yaakov Avinu. Yaakov Avinu, if you remember, had a dream and he saw a ladder, and on this ladder it says that Malach uh, Olden Vyorodimbo, they were going up and down on it. Now, the Medrash says there are actually four angels. By an angel, of course, we have to say an angel doesn't mean, you know, some uh, Hollywood extra with a fluorescent tube around his head. We've got these sort of <laughs> pictures in our head of angel. An angel is a spiritual messenger. The word malach in Hebrew means a messenger. And in this particular case, these were actually the spiritual, the, the, the defending powers, the championing powers of the four great exiles, the four great nations. And the dream of Yaakov Avinu was, first of all, he saw the Malach of Bovel going up 70 rungs up the ladder and coming down again. And the Malach of Porosomode went up 52, came down again. The Malach of Yovan of Greece went up 180, came down again. And the Malach of Edom was kept going up and up and up and up and we're still in that exile to this day. But, says the prophet of Adia, with prophetic vision, says to this, in Tagbiya Kanesha, uh, and, and Yaakov, sorry, Yaakov Avinu became very, very scared, says the Med- Medrash. And the Kodesh Baruch answered Yaakov Avinu, he says, I'll, do, do not be uh, scared, my, my servant Yaakov, Avdi Yaakov. And then he quotes the, what Avadia will say in his prophecy, Im tagbiya kanesha, if, referring to the Malach, if you will rise up, the Malach of Edom, the Malach of Esau, if you'll rise up like an eagle, ubein kochavim and amongst the stars, tasim kinecho, you will, sorry, sim kinecho, nevertheless, misham from there, oridecho numa I'm going to bring you down even from there, that this angel, the Malach, of Edom, of Esau, seems to go up and up and up and up, and it seems to be without end. But a Kodesh Baruch whose promise is eventually it'll come, that empire will come tumbling down. And that's what we're waiting for. Now, we're going to see that <coughs> this is the four exiles, and the four exiles base their malchus on, on us. Each succeeding kingdom so to speak, snatches it from the one prior to it. First of all, the Babylonians came along and they took the Malchus. And I think we discussed maybe last week or the week before about the idea of David, Melech Israel, and Sodom, and the idea of music, and Naim Zemiris Israel. We're not going to go into that now. But the idea is that <coughs> each of these particular kingdoms justify themselves, validate themselves as being the true Israel. And we see for sure the last of these four kingdoms this is their belief, this is their faith. They are the real Israel. They have what they call a New Testament. So they, so to speak, sup- they say, we've superseded you, we've replaced you. And that basically, starting off with Bovel, Bovel rested the Malchus from Klal Israel. <coughs> then the Persians came along and took it from them. <coughs> then the... the um, the, the Greeks came along, took it from them, and the Romans took it from them. Now the sign, the symbol of the of Esau <coughs> is the is the pig, is the chazir. Why? Because Esau, so to speak, tries to push him to show himself as really a kind of a Yisrael. He says, "I'm kosher. Look, and I have I have cloven, cloven hooves. I'm okay." Of course, he's, he's as trafe as anything because he's, doesn't, he's not a ruminant. He doesn't regurgitate, regurgitate the, the cud. That's why the, the symbol, the simon of, of Esau is the, the pig. On a deeper level, though, the word chazir is connected to the word 
lahachzir, which means to return. And because they will be the nation which will eventually will return the Malchus to Klal Yisrael. Now there's another <coughs> system which we're talking tonight about. That's Esau, that's Edom. That's Edom, as we said, is the inheritor, going backwards, of Greece, of, of Modai, of Poros, Babel, and eventually they've taken the Malchus from us. But there's another part of exile, and that's the exile of Yishmael. There's another vision of the, the concept of, of exile, which is the dream of Daniel, the prophet Daniel, <coughs> who sees the Tsuras Odom, the shape of a man, and Daniel addresses the king Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, and he says, you are the golden head. Babylon, so to speak, was the head. The two arms are Porus, Modai, and Yovan is the body. And now this is where it diverges. And of course, the Tzur Sa'odam, the anti-man, so to speak, this is the anti-Tzur, the tzur, true Tzur Sa'odam is, is Israel. But the anti-man, this statue represented in the dream of, of Daniel, is has two legs, and those two legs are, on the one hand, Edom, which we've been talking about, and Yishmoel. Now, it's interesting because <clears throat> the nature of Yishmoel and Edom is there's a symbiotic relationship there. If a person, Rahman al loses a hand, an arm, he can still use the other hand. The arms are independent. The legs require one another. A person with only Rahman al-Tzlan lower lane, who only has one leg, he, he cannot do anything with that one leg, one leg by itself. So the, the nature of this relationship between Esau, Edom, and Ishmael is symbiotic. Is they rely on one another. They're, they're, they're <clears throat> now, as we said, on the one hand, we've got this idea of the four kingdoms, the four Dalmalchiuses, which are all... Uh, trace their lineage, trace their, their claim back to us. Ishmael, however, is unique. Ishmael is the people, the only people which claim, apart from us, to have the power of Abraham. <clears throat> and Abraham promised Eretz Israel. And Abraham entered into 13 brisos. Sorry, Hashem entered into 13 Brisos, covenants with Abraham Avinu. And Chazal say that Abraham merited the land through Brismila. Now we know that Brismila is also practiced by Ishmael. Their tenure on the land, their claim to the land, comes through the schus of Brismila. But just like their Brismila is incomplete, so their tenure, so their ability to hold on to the land will be incomplete. But they do have a claim. <clears throat> With regard to Yishmoel, the Zohar says that the Malach of Yishmoel stood before Hashem for hundreds of years, asserting that anyone who has the bris should have a portion in the land. And that's why, let's not fool ourselves, Yishmoel will never let us have the land back willingly. It's just impossible for him. Because he understands, and we listen to their rhetoric, and we look at their school books, and we see everything totally disenfranchises the Jewish people's claim. Because they claim, and to a certain extent we'll see, there's some validity. Being a descendant of Avram, Avram Avinu, and being the fact that they have a bris, even though that bris is incomplete. So they do have a certain power to the land, and they will prevent... They will try as much as they can to prevent Claudius Yisrael from possessing it. <clears throat> so as we said, these, the two legs of exile, the end of exile, is Yishmoel and Edom. And they work together. They work together even nowadays, because you see that it's amazing to me that in the United Nations, I don't have figures, statistics on this, 
excuse me, but I'm sure anybody with a fairly minimum amount of research could figure out that the amount of time that this little country called the little state of Israel is discussed and vilified and pilloried in the United Nations for its so-called uh, 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 apartheid or whatever they want to call it, compared with the very real uh, human rights um, violations which are going on in all the other parts of the world, it's just completely disproportional. We see clearly that it bothers Edom that we should be there, that we should be here, and Ishmael, because they understand that it's there, also don't want us to be here. They are the two agents of exile <coughs> at the end of the days, at the end of days. So the thing is, exactly how do we combat these two, the two threats? The name Ishmael, there's a brayser in the Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer, which describes Bilam's description, which cites Bilam's description of the end of days. <coughs> and it, fo- it includes the following prediction. Oi means, a posse from the Torah, in Bamidba, Perik Dalad, Chav Gimel, <coughs> and Bilam raised up his moshal, his parable, Boyoma, and he said, Oi mi yichie be sumo keil. Oi mi yichie be sumo keil. So the Bryson explains that these words are, mean as follows Oi, woe. Who yichie? Who will be able to live? In the days of Misumo Kale, when the nation that has the name Kale, Sumo means the Lashon of shame, from the name, when a nation who has the name of Kale in it, and of course Kale means power, when that nation has the power in the world. <clears throat> now there are only two nations that the Koresh Baruch out of the 70 nations. Who have the name, part of the name Kale. There's Yishma Kale and Yisra Kale. And they represent two very, very different approaches to Hashem. What does it mean? Uh, let me start with a, a story. A friend of mine's wife was walking through the Shuk, and she's quite a brave, brave, brave lady. <laughs> She got chatting in the Arab quarter with this um, Arab. And he said to her, you know, you Jews, you, you have no faith. You have no faith. You don't believe in God. And she said, why? He said, because you're scared to walk here. You're scared to come here. And, he said, she, and she said, but, um, but it's dangerous here. He said, no. If I kill you, that's what God wants. <laughs> sure. That's what God wants, because, because I did it. Nothing can happen that God doesn't want. In other words, the attitude of Yishmael is, Yishma, Kale, Yishma, you listen. Kale, you, God, you listen. You, what I do, you will listen to. So to speak, I am binding God to my desire, to my wishes, because the fact that I did it proves that he wanted it. This is the ultimate fatalism. If I did it, it means Hashem wanted it. And to that mentality, the Jewish idea that no, that's true, nothing happens, happens without God wanting it. Hakol, Safui, everything is foreseen. Aval harashus natun, but we still have freedom of will. This difficult conundrum is something which does not exist in the mind of Yishmael. Yeah. Everything is fate. Yishma Kale, I did it. Yishma Kale, listen to what I'm doing. We say no. Yesha Kale. What God does is straight. Yesha means straight. The Jewish people vindicate Hashem's actions. We don't expect Hashem to vindicate what we do. <clears throat> but these are the two nations which have the name 
the, as we said, boy, oi, woe, me, yichia, to the one who will have to live, misumo kale, when there's a nation who has the name, has the word kale in his name, yishma el, yishma kale. <coughs> Thank you very much. Yishmael was the brother of Yitzhak, and Yaakov was the brother of Esau. Clearly, this is Ezer Le'umat Zer. This one opposed to this one. The Kodesh Baruch who created everything in this world. Zer Le'umat Zer. This opposed to that. Black and white, positive and negative. Good and bad, night and day. The construction of this world is binary. And that's why it has to be that the... So Yitzhak, Yitzhak is the Amud of Tefillah. <coughs> He's the Amud HaAvoda. He's the pillar of... Thank you, I really appreciate that. Right, great, thank you. It's not just Yitzhak Avinu is Davins. He is a, a worshipper. He is the Korban who was sacrificed to Hashem. There's a Medrash said, there's a Medrash, a Medrash says an understanding that in point of fact that Hashem's Afro Shel Yitzhak, the ashes of Yitzhak, are Munach in front of a Kodesh Baruch all the time. That in a certain way, in a certain sense, on a certain level, actually Yitzhak was a Korban. And therefore, he just as we say nowadays, what is what is in place of the Avodas Beis Hamikdash? We say is tefillah. So Yitzhak was wasn't just didn't just pray; he was the korban. He is tefillah. He is the power, the pillar of Avoda. And connected that was Yishmoel, because Yishmoel was named on account of the tefillah of Hagar. And his name also reveals Tefillah. He's based on Tefillah. It says in, in Sefer Bereshis, Vayomala Malach Hashem to Hagar. The Malach of Hashem said to Hagar, Hinoch, behold, Hara, you are pregnant, Vyoladat, Ben, and you're going to give birth to a, a boy, Vakaros Shemo Yishmoel. And you're going to call his name Yishmoel. Why? Ki Shoma Hashem El Onyech. Because Hashem has heard to your, your groaning, your, your... Yishmael also is the power of tefillah. And this really is the clash on the level of, of, of Yitzhak between the two opposing forces. Yishmael believes in the God of Abraham. Abraham was his father. And while there's a lot of dofi, falsehood, in many aspects of Yishmael, the Rambam says, there is no dofi in Yishmael's belief in the achtos Hashem, the unity of Hashem. Which, of course, is not the, true, not the case of Esau. In fact, the Rambam goes into great details as to, it could be that uh, Christianity is a vodah zorah. Nafkamina, whether you can daven in a church, or in a, a mosque. So I'm not sure I would advise you to daven in a mosque. It might, wouldn't be particularly safe. But <laughs> from the point of view of whether it's a mockum of Oda Zara, no, it's not. Masha Enkain in the church, and again, I'm not getting into the halachic ramifications, but probably most churches would be considered bate of Oda Zara. In fact, there's a story that I heard from Ramosha Shapiro, Zechazal who told of a story of someone that he knew, who passed away many, many years before he passed away. And the father of this person, going all the way back, was a mashbak, he was an assistant to Rabbi Yehuda Leib Diskin. Now, you're sure that Leib Diskin was one of the pillars of Yerushalayim. He lived in the old city amongst the Muslims. And the story came down from this fellow who used to uh, um, assist him, that he would never walk in front, Daladam was in front of an Arab while he was prostrating when he was davening. Ad Kach. 
In other words, he understood that the prayer of an Yishmael is, is, is something. It's not a Vodazara. He is praying to the one God, and of course, many of his ideas are completely off the wall. The Rambam describes how, why they pray five, five times a day, because he came into a shul on Yom Kippur, and he saw us diving five times. In fact, his original, original, uh, his original uh, how do you say, uh, mission was to the Jews. The reason, at the, the, the beginning, and interestingly, also like the founder of Christianity, that both of these schismatic m- movements understood that their, their mission was to the Jews, and that, you know, I came, I've come to complete, the, complete you. I'm not, I don't want a different religion. Uh, the founder of Christianity came along, and he understood that he was, you know, he, he was just another of the prophets. And all the first Christians, if you ask them what their religion was, they'd say Jewish. The idea of a Christian only came later on. That's a whole story in itself. But in the beginning, the founder of Christianity didn't see himself as setting up a new religion. And also, too, with uh, Muhammad. Muhammad understood, saw himself as the last of the prophets, but in the same line as the prophets. And he was very, very infuriated by the fact that we would not accept him. (laughs) And that's really where the hatred stems from this day, because... If you look in the Quran, I, I haven't studied the Quran at all, but there are parts of the Quran where are much more sympathetic to the Jews and some which are very anti. And it's clear that in the beginning and also historically, he, want, he made overtures to the Jewish people that we should accept him and he would just, in other words, he'd become Jewish rather than we'd become Muslim. And that didn't work as we know and it didn't work with the founder of Christianity as well. <clears throat> the point is that the anti the tzad, the tzad shekeneged of Yitzhak the, the avoda of the, the pillar of avoda Amuda avoda is Yishmael and Yaakov Avinu Yaakov Avinu represents Torah Yaakov Avinu represents the Ole Torah. When this week's Pasha, when Esau, they both grow up, grow up, and when they get to Bar Mitzvah, Esau goes out and he becomes a murderer and a Vodazoranik and a, and, a, and a rapist. And Yaakov Avinu goes to the Ole Torah. Yaakov is Torah. So these are the two legs. And these, this is really what I wanted to get to, the point of our, our shir tonight, is that if we have any hope of being able to wrest Eretz Israel back from these two powers, the power that in the nations of the world calls us uh, racist, uh, accuses us of being Ganavim, that power is the power of Torah. It's only through our koich in learning Torah that the nations will finally see who we are. There's a medrash that says, Hakol Kol Yaakov. The voice is the voice of Jacob, Yudayim Yudayim Esav. Kol Zman, Shekolo Shal Yaakov Babate Knesios Ubate Medrashos. All the while that there is the kol of the Torah, of the, 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 the kol, sorry, the voice of Yaakov in the shuls and in the Beti Madrash, the Beti Madrash study halls, Ein Hayadaim Yedei Esav. There is no Yedaim Yedei Esav. Macholzman, Shein Kola, Metzaf Seif, Babati Knesios, Babati Mitrashos. But when the coal is not sounding out in the shuls and in the Beti Madrash, Beti Madrashos, Hayadaim Yedei Esav. There's a symbiotic relationship between Esav and Yaakov just as there is a symbiotic relationship between uh, Yitzhak and Yishmael. There's a Gemara which says, de- de- um, defining basically, um, Yerushalayim as the Jewish people, and Kisaria as Esau. And it says that, and of course if we look at their birth, Yaakov was holding onto his heel. That's why it's called Yaakov, holding on to the heel of Esau. There's the, the two twins, they are twins. 
And the idea is that both cannot be up at the same time. The Gemara says, I think it's the Gemara in Sukkot, I forget now. But when Esau is up, Yaakov will be down. And when Yaakov is down, Esau will be up. It can't be they're both up. We can't, there's no, the room, the world is not big enough to hold both of us together. And if you think about it, this is exactly what the, the distillation, the tamsis of Esau is a molek. And the molek is that nation that reveals himself in every generation to have an unbridled, illogical hatred of the Jewish people. And it was quite clear that the biggest enemy of ours in the last hundred years, may his name rot, I'm not going to say his, say his name, understood, if you look at what his idea of, it was the idea of Esau, Yedayim Yedei Esau, the Germans were the most incredible manufacturers to this day, unfortunately. And it was true before the war, science, medicine, years back. Yedayim Yedei Esau, And that's what he wanted. He wanted to obliterate. He understood that, that if Esau is up, Yaakov has to go down. We have to push the Jews. We have to obliterate the Jews because the, the world is not big enough for both of us. Mm-hmm. Parenthetically, I just want to say that, you know, uh, I, I, like to, I, mean, I like to read history and I like biographies, but I, only, I try and only read autobiographies. And the reason is because when you're reading a biography, you're never quite sure where the bias, the prejudice of the writer is. When you're reading an autobiography, you're, you're sure you know. The person's writing about himself. So you know how to take it with a large pinch of salt. It's totally not objective, but very fascinating. I read the autobiography of Chaim Weitzman. It's an interesting book. And he describes how after he moved to Eretz Israel, how on, I think it was a Rosh Hashanah at night, how all of these streams of Kibbutznik boys and girls all, all flooded, crowded up the hill to his home, and he describes them coming up the hill, these tall, strapping, blonde, healthy, tanned, uh, young specimens. And, and the description read to me something like Laney Le, Le, Riefenstahl's Triumph of the Will. Laney Riefenstahl, Yamach Shema, was uh, Hitler's... Uh, made do- documentaries of, of propaganda films for the Nazis. And she was a very good cinematographer. And uh, if you look back at them, they're frighteningly clever in the way they are able to. But that's the whole image, you know, of this, the low angle against the, the jaw jutting out, this idea of the Yadayim Yaday Esau. It's amazing that, you know, that the, the whole of this the Zionist picture of what a Jew should be was completely, the Nazis sold them that picture. That's what you have to be. Yadayim Yaday Esau. No, Yadayim Yaday Esau. Yadayim not, not Yaakov. And that's not to say that we can't be brilliant at things which require the, the hands, but that's not who we are. We're the people of the book, as Muhammad rightly described us. Not the Am Ha'aretz, not the people of the land, which is what the Zionists wanted to turn us into. Back to the land. Close your books. Leave the Batim Midrash. When that happens, that is the worst thing for us holding on to Eretz Israel, wow. Because our schus in Eretz Israel, our ability to bring the Golas to the end, is that we have to fight the two last legs of exile, which are Yishmoel, which is, means our tefillah has to be as s- sincere and, and as, as better than his. <coughs> they told me, you know, on the, when they got the World Cup in wherever it is... Uh, Qatar, Qatar. So, you know, I, I promise you, on all of the Qatari airlines, I know for a fact they have them with Saudi Arabian airlines, they have an area marked off there in the middle of the plane. To watch the... No, 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 to, to have a shul, to have a, a mosque, a little mosque. They got carpets on the floor. Halavai, we should have that on El Al. No Arab, I've never, show me an Arab who's embarrassed to pull out his rag, rug and, 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 and daven right there on the spot. For all of their mistakes, their dofi, as the Rambam says, but nobody can take a fact away from the fact that they are extreme. They are ma'aminim. They have terrible, extremely strong emuna. And if we want to combat that, then we have to 
Ad davening, Ad tfila, Ad emuna in the Kaddish Baruch Hu has to be just as strong as theirs. And on the other hand, with Esau, Esau, work of the hands, is the material world, is the illusions of the West, is the Bittles man of the smartphone. That's your day, your day, Esau. And the only way we will vanquish that is with the Kol, Kol Yaakov, with the voice of Torah. This is the end of, it's the end of the Shia, it's the end of the exile we're coming to. We're coming to the end. And that is our mission. Our mission, they're not going to change their minds. Yishmael is not going to give us this land back. The only way we will be able to wrest it from him is if we embody that same koyach of tefillah, which is the bequest of Avram Avinu, which he gave both to Yishmael and to, to Yitzhak, and also the bequest we have of Torah, and that Torah which stands and shows everything that Esau, the Yadayim of Esau holds to be dear, is valueless when compared with the values of Torah, of Lima the Torah, and of living the Torah. Yeah. Why, why is Ishmael's uh, bris not complete? Because they don't do uh, technically part of the bris. They don't um, fold back the priya. They don't do priya. Okay. They they don't they, the, the 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 way they do the bris is not a complete bris mila. So just so like their bris is incomplete, so that fisa their hold over Eretz Yisrael is incomplete because their schus to the land comes through bris mila. Okay.